uh, kia ora tato. Uh, thanks for, uh, to Apiculture New Zealand for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and apologies, you're going to have to listen to my Irish accent now, so hopefully you can understand that. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of um, the current response in New Zealand and what we've been doing in that space. Um, and just to note that it is a joint response between MPI and DOC, uh, and Apiculture New Zealand sit on the governance board for that response along with other industries and iwi um, groups. So uh, my presentation, the basic outline, just a little bit of background on Myrtle Rust. Most of you may know uh, most of that, and apologies if I bore you. Um, what happened on Raoul Island, which um, the incursion there was on the 27th of March when it was first detected. Uh, what's happened in New Zealand so, so far. Some of the risks for New Zealand, including to apiculture ap um, and manuka uh, and other plants, and the research that's required from now on, um, which is substantial. So as many of you may know, uh, myrtle rust is a serious fungal disease which affects uh, species in the myrtle family or the myrtaceae. It's a notifiable organism under the Biosecurity Act um, and it affects dozens of New Zealand native species which are culturally, ecologically and economically important, uh, some of which are already highly threatened including Bartlett's rata which has less than 20 um, individuals left in the wild. It also affects many important and iconic non-native species like feijoa, guava, and eucalyptus. Um, and many of these are really important nursery, horticultural, and amenity species. Um, Myrtle rust is a very dynamic disease. Its host ra range has expanded and changed as it's jumped from country to country. Um, and the way it affects species has changed as it jumps um, between countries and states as well. And in recent years, it's gone from affecting 100 uh, species of Myrtaceae to now over 400, many of those which are in uh, Australia, and um, which Jeff Pegg, who's speaking after me, I'm sure will um, detail. Um, and obviously it can disperse on many, in many ways, but the biggest long range dispersal is by microscopic spores on the wind. Uh, and Nimwa have modeled this for us over the years, and we believe that this is the likely potential source of this infection across uh, the North Island of New Zealand and Raoul Island. So before uh, Myrtle Rust got to New Zealand, we had done um, an impact assessment on the types of things it might affect. Um, health is, a, is, not a, is not a major one, although, well, it directly it won't affect health. It, it will have indirect uh, impacts on people's health in terms of um, you know, damage to their industries or if cultural values are damaged, that could also cause some um, health effects in the population. However, it has extremely high potential for environmental impact. Uh, Maori and cultural impacts, obviously, with our um, Tonga species. Uh, Socio-cultural for everybody in New Zealand. I mean, some of those species are highly iconic. If you look at Pudakawa, it's on nearly all of our postcards. Every summer, kind of picture is under Pudakawa on the beach. Um, and it could have major kind of impacts for, for us as Kiwis. Um, preliminary modeling on the economic impacts are that it will be low to moderate, but uh, the full effects of, of those, those impacts will probably not be seen for five to ten years as the disease impacts take hold in New Zealand. I won't go through all of this, but we have been working on this threat since 2010, um, and we've done um, a lot of research, a lot of diagnostic research, risk analyses, modelling of where um, the disease could take hold, um, and we've collaborated with many uh, individuals and agencies over those years to try and prepare ourselves for this threat, knowing that it would probably eventually get here no matter what we did based on its wind dispersal abilities. So Myrtle Rust has moved around the world quite rapidly in the last, um, I suppose, 20 years, but interestingly, it hadn't really moved very far for about 120 years from when it was first discovered or, or identified in South America until the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, that may be because it wasn't identified correctly when it appeared or that something has changed in the world and allowed it to move around more rapidly or um, allowed it to adapt to living in other environments. Um, obviously New Zealand isn't on this map because we're just this year, 2017, um, and unfortunately it has finally gotten here. Oh, there we are. <laughs> um, so Myrtle Rist is different from many of our other biosecurity threats that MPI deal with in that it has never successfully been eradicated from any infected area, state, or country. Um, it also has extremely quick modes of spread, low feasibility of control tools for large-scale control, um, and the logistical challenges of multiple infection sites, many of which are quite hard to detect until the latter stages of infection. 
It's an extremely complex biosecurity challenge for MPI, DOC, and New Zealand in that it affects multiple values. Um, mul it has multiple plant hosts. There are numerous strains, of which we only have one at the moment, but there are up to seven. It could affect multiple regions across New Zealand. Uh, there are no known large-scale control tools or no safe large-scale control tools. And if you compare it with cowrie dieback, one of our other environmental biosecurity programs, that was one affected species across four, five regions. This could be dozens and dozens of affected species across pretty much the whole of New Zealand. Uh, the other difficulty with it is the symptoms are cryptic or, or often invisible until it's too late. And once you see the symptoms on plants, then the spores are already airborne and probably on the move. Um, just a little bit of background on plant diseases. There is a lot of uncertainty as to how myrtle rust will impact in New Zealand. And the reason for that is that there are three aspects to any plant disease development. Uh, those are, it needs a favorable environment. The pathogen needs to be abundant and able to move around. Um, and host susceptibility obviously comes into play as well because you could have a, quite a good environment, quite a lot of the pathogen, but if your hosts aren't susceptible, then you don't get infected. And if you remove or change any one of these kind of triangle of effects, then you get variable impacts. And that's why we really don't know at this point how badly myrtle rust will impact in New Zealand. Um, there are over 350 potential hosts in New Zealand, 28 of them are native, but obviously the susceptibility of these plants under New Zealand conditions is completely unknown because we've never had the disease here before. Um, we're getting a pretty good idea that Pahutakawa will be very badly impacted, uh, and some of the rata species, uh, along with Ramarama, Lophomyrtus velata, but in terms of other species, we just don't know yet. Uh, the climatic suitability in New Zealand has been modelled multiple times over the years. And as you can see from this map, quite a lot of New Zealand will be suitable either all through the year or in, in, in the um, spring and autumn seasons. And if you look at the right-hand figure in red, if you uh, add all those areas up to the places that are seasonally uh, favourable or marginal, you get up to 95% of New Zealand being suitable. Uh, and obviously that will actually increase as climate change happens and the environment becomes more moist and wet. Um, and many of you will notice this year was really a bumper year for fungus. Um, there were mushrooms everywhere and that may be why Myrtle Ross has finally gotten a hole this year as well. It was just really ideal conditions. So just quickly on what happened on Raoul initially. So Myrtle Rust was, we were, was reported to us on the 27th of uh, March from Raoul Island. Obviously, it's an extremely uh, isolated island, over a thousand kilometers from Auckland. And dock staff go out there once every three to six months and then they don't come back. So luckily, they notified us on a Monday that they had a suspect site and it just so happened they were coming back, leaving that Wednesday. So they brought samples with them um, and it was identified positively on the Friday, which was the 1st of April. Uh, everybody who came back from the island on that Friday went through an extremely thorough decontamination procedure, as did the whole ship they were on, probably the most thorough decontamination procedure New Zealand's ever carried out. Um, and we then worked on what we could do on Raoul, given that we knew Myrtle Rust was present. So within a fortnight, from the 1st to the 18th of April, dock staff were surveying the island on the tracks only. It's an active volcano. It's very... Um, marginal as to where you can and can't go on the island. So they looked across all the tracks on the island and within a fortnight, the polygon of um, area between infected sites was over a thousand hectares, which was over a third of the island. And at that point, only less than 2% of the island had been surveyed. Um, so at that point, it was decided that Myrtle Ross was, was quite widespread. There was nothing we could do to control it because it's an extremely sensitive ecosystem there. We couldn't spray fungicide in large quantities. The marine environment there is extremely sensitive as well. And there are many endemic species that do not occur anywhere else in the world. Um, and because it's a, a sanctuary, um, all mammalian pests were removed in 2012. There are some species there that will likely um, suffer quite badly from this incursion. So instead of controlling it, we started urgently collecting seed from the Kermadec Pudakawa, which is the dominant tree species there. About 9% of the forest is, is Pudakawa. Um, DOC have started long-term monitoring to help with prediction of when or how a, poten a potential ecosystem collapse might happen. Um, to date, there has been quite severe impacts on some of the Pudakawa with some canopy dieback already occurring. And in previous years, um, 
when the, when the Pudakawa failed to flower on Raoul, that some species did become locally extinct. Um, Tui and other birds that depend on nectar became locally extinct there. So there could be some severe knock-on effects to species dependent on that forest ecosystem, which we really want to monitor and move species off the island if we have to, um, to protect them uh, using ex situ conservation techniques. The other thing we're really worried about um, on Raoul is that if the whole canopy collapses or if there's a large scale loss of trees, we could get increased sedimentation into the marine environment, which is UNESCO um, World Heritage Marine Reserve. So that would also be a disaster for the marine environment there. Moving on to the current New Zealand situation. Um, so on 2nd of May, Martha Rust was reported to MPI um, from a plant nursery in Kerry Kerry on Pahutakawa and eucalypt seedlings. Um, it subsequently turned out to be positive. Within 24 hours, we'd identified it as positive. And since then, as of Friday, it's been detected at 82 sites across the North Island. Um, 17th of May, it was found in New Plymouth, the 21st in the Waikato, and the 12th of June in Tapuka in the Bay of Plenty. Um, many of the original sites can be kind of traced or um, linked to each other, but the Bay of Plenty one is a completely isolated infection. And it kind of gives us an idea that basically these, this infection pretty much happened around the same time, maybe February or March spores were blown here. And there are likely to be spores across the North Island of New Zealand. Um, and we may not be seeing all the infections that are present purely because of the span of the area we're looking at. And because it is winter, symptoms will be suppressed at the moment, except in kind of microclimates like nurseries, which are perfect for spore development. Um, so far, there are several species which Myrtle has been detected. Only one of these plants so far has been Manuka. So this is a map of the current sites. You can see there's quite a span between them across the North Island. And that red circle is just around New Plymouth where we've implemented a controlled area notice. So the challenges with this response are obviously um, the multiple issues I've um, mentioned before, being that it disperses really quickly via wind. Once it's visible, it's dispersing. The fungicides that are available are highly ecotoxic and can only be suitable for local control. You cannot use them near waterways, or if you do, you have to be extremely careful. There's large research gaps, and there's also issues with social license and engagement. Um, in a fast-moving situation like this, we try to engage uh, proactively with whoever we need to do so, but we also need to make quick decisions, and it has been a very fast-moving response. So we've been doing a lot of seed banking on the mainland. Um, We've con uh, commissioned an economic impact assessment and a non-market valuation assessment which will look at biodiversity impacts. They're due by the end of this month. And we're doing some small scale control tools on fungicides along with the actual response work itself, which is um, locking down nurseries, treating plants, removing hosts, thing like, things like that. Currently, uh, nurseries have been most affected by the response, um, but some horticultural and honey industries are concerned about spray drift or contamination um, into their properties if we are using these fung fungicides, which are probably not ideal for uh, bees. Um, and then the general public will obviously have uh, concerns about spraying on a you know, larger or mo moderate scale even. Um, we've put restrictions of movement around New Plymouth of any Myrtaceae out of that controlled area, which is quite restrictive for some people. Um, and we're also concerned about non-target impacts of spraying on valued trees. So if we spray Pudakawa, will that actually um, damage the Pudakawa in the long term? Um, and we've gotten Tangata Whenua, um, enabled them to, to start participating in activities with us, with us, including surveillance and seed collection. So just an overview of the risks for New Zealand as a whole. Um, I mean, Murderous is native to South America and it has not co-evolved with our Myrtaceae in New Zealand. Therefore, we, like as I said before, we just cannot determine what the exact impacts will be here um, because of the disease triangle I mentioned before. Um, however, we know there will be a whole range of impacts um, and all of our actions need to be informed by best practice in science. So for apiarists, um, there has been an Australian, I'm sure Jeff and Ted will speak about this, Myrtle infections identified in flowering and fruiting species, and it has taken three to five years for the full impacts to be starting to be seen in Australia. Um, winter feed might be affected from eucalyptus infections, and there could be problems with fungicidal residues in honey, we're just not sure. The Manuka honey industry, uh, the degree of susceptibility of Leptospermum species, which is similar to Manuka in Australia, has been variable, but many of the Australian forms of Leptospermum 
Sperm and Scoparium, which is our Manuka do not match the New Zealand forms. So just because something's happened there doesn't mean it will happen here. Um, and Manuka has undergone rapid diversification from a fairly restricted genetic uh, base. So there is some genetic bottlenecking there, which could actually mean that New Zealand Manuka might be at more risk from these types of infections. We need a lot of research. Um, we've currently got some stuff underway and there's currently some stuff um, getting underway, but we're looking to get quite a large sum of money up and running in the next year uh, for research needs going forward. Um, and thank you all for listening and I'll be there to answer your questions in the panel uh, shortly after this talk. Thank you.